Hi, I'm Will from Tested. I'm Adam from Tested. Adam, we're standing in front of a table saw today. Yeah. And we have three things here. We have three things to talk about. Um, we, we've talked about stuff that I build as a hobby, stuff mm -hmm. that I collect, stuff that I have found, stuff that I've traded. Um, but we've talked precious little about stuff that I actually did for a living before I did Mythbusters. And these are three different examples of, uh, three actually great representative examples of the type of model making that I did uh, that was my bread and butter for 10 years. So so before Mythbusters, yeah. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know this, but maybe they don't, you, you built models. I built models for movies, for commercials, for photography, for toy prototyping. I built models for many different industries. And this was kind of during the transition from a lot of CG, uh, from a lot of practice effects with models and stuff like that to a more CG focused special effects industry, yeah, right? Well, we watched that happening as, as I, I feel like I snaked into this industry of special effects model making at the end of the whole era <laughs> where things were actually really good. Well, it's and, coming back now, it seems like, a little bit. You know, I think there's always going to be certain directors who really like practical effects. Ridley Scott really likes practical mm -hmm. effects. John Favreau, Peter Jackson, I've talked about these guys. And, and, you know, they're always going to have a place for that because actors really like working with practical things. Mm -hmm. But that, that's... It's not a universal. I mean, you get an actor who's used to performing on stage and theater, and they love blue screen. They're used to pretending that there's an army over there because they do it on stage. Right. Uh, so, you know, it, it goes back and forth. I think there's always going to be a place for it. It's just not nearly as prevalent and will never again be as prevalent as it was in the mid-80s and the early 90s. No more, no more Jean-Claude Van Damme jumping off of a fake model of a dam and skating down or any of that business. No more Superman dam bursting where you can tell that the dam's <sighs> only two feet high. Or, or, <laughs> or the White House blowing up where you realize that they laid it on its back and shot it from above and... It's, it's, that, that stuff looks so much realer in a lot of cases than, than bad CG. But do you know, actually I'll tell you one of my all time favorite super low, low tech uh, special effects in Blade Runner. Uh, Deckard enters the, uh, uh, enters the hotel where Jeff Sebastian and Roy Batty are at the end of the movie mm -hmm. and it's all decrepit and water all over the, it's a famous building downtown LA called the Bradbury Building. Um, and it has this beautiful ornate skylight, uh, slatted windows, and it's just gorgeous. I've actually been in the building, I've ridden those elevators. They, they don't let most people in, but my friend and I convinced them in the late 90s to go, <laughs> and we, got, we spent a whole day there looking around and taking pictures. And at one point, Deckard looks up, and this blimp that you've been seeing throughout the movie is flying over the windows, and its lights are shining through the windows, and you're like, what a beautiful shot. Oh my God, how did they get that? Uh -huh. Here's how they got it. They took a picture of the skylight of the Bradbury Hotel. Then they printed it up really big and carefully cut out oh. every window. Oh, and no. then they put the blimp behind it, smoked it up, and filmed it. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Isn't that great? That's amazing. That's, it's, 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 it's exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly you right. You didn't need to do any more than that to make that shot absolutely perfect. Well, it's the least you can do to get the shot that you need on film. With that in mind, so the type of work, there are a lot of different kinds of model making, um, but it really falls into two camps, I think. It's hard edge model making, and then there's sculpting. Okay. So sculpting is characters, creatures, faces, people, makeup, and that kind Masks, of thing. Masks, all the kind of crazy monster right. makeup is what I usually think of in the that kind of The stuff that Rick Baker you know, built his empire on. Uh, that's, the, that's the sculpting. Uh, then there's the hard edge model making, the spaceships, the props, the guns, those kind of things. Cars, and, boats. And while I have taught myself sculpting to some degree, to make my Maltese Falcon and stuff like that, my, my specialty really is hard edge model making. And these are three great representative examples of the different kinds of model making that I would have to do. Um, this is the first one to demonstrate. Um, this is a Y-wing fighter from, is, from Star Wars. Fond from my, I remember this fondly from my childhood. We played with a Kenner version of this that seemed a little bit longer. Well, so I will tell you that, where do I start? I built this in 1999 for Galoob Toys. Okay. They were building some prototypes for some mid-range micro machines and this is one of them. Now, when I built this, it was required that I be tremendously accurate in every detail that I could because Lucasfilm Licensing wanted every toy that was made from their stuff to be really accurate. So this is from archive photos and from really exacting reference. So I can tell you that this is exactly right. However, I can also tell you that no two Y-wings from the movies <laughs> are the same. And, and could you just go back into the vault and you know, put on the white gloves and no. take one of the original models out? At that point, uh, I didn't have that kind of access. Oh, okay. um, I managed to get, I got some photos 
photo reference from Lucasfilm, some from some of the books that had come out, like the big Star Wars books. Mm -hmm. um, and I, this is scratch built by me over about a two week period. So when you're building something like this, what's, like, what, what, what's your starting point? Not, not on art, but like, what's, what's the material base here? There's a couple of different, so you look at this and you realize, all right, there's these main hard parts. So mm -hmm. clearly that's going to be uh, probably tube plastic. Okay. So I'll look for uh, the brands of that Plastruct or Evergreen that make tube plastic because that makes it easy to glue to. I can cut out small plastic details and glue them to that really easily. So you figure out what scale it is, figure out what type what type of pipe you need from it, tube plastic you need from there, and then build everything else out from that point? Exactly. Then there is the nacelles here, the front mm -hmm. curve part. I knew I was going to lathe those. On the real one, I believe it's legs, eggs. Remember legs? Oh, yeah, yeah. The pit, oh, wow. I believe the front of the real size <laughs> studio scale one was legs, eggs. So I had to actually <laughs> lathe that curve, and then I vacuum formed it. Okay. And then these are two vacuum forms placed over that. Then I, there's a lot of repeating details on this mm -hmm. and because I was working in a non-standard scale I had to continually make a detail and then cast it and make cast it, mold it, and then make castings of that detail to repeat it around. Oh, because you, you couldn't just go out and buy the same, you couldn't kit bash, basically. No, no. Uh, so there is a bunch of kit bashing in here, but there's also tons of me just with lots of tiny little pieces of styrene carefully Wow. Slowly assembling. Um, I'm quite proud. If you look very closely at the R2-D2, he's, he's pretty exact. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And he's, he's, is he, he's, he's, uh, you carved out the top panels and I everything. I built that all from scratch. Wow. So how accurate did you want, you, you, this had to be exactly accurate, accurate for Galoob, right? This had to be exactly accurate. Yeah. Okay. And so the, the way this, the progression for Galoob at that time in the late nineties was they would get a prototype model that was perfect. Mm -hmm. And then they would send that to their manufacturer China who would then build a toy prototype based off of that and that toy prototype would include how they would build its screw bosses it's hollow where the you know if it shot little somethings how that worked etc kind of like how the Lego masters take what it's supposed to look like and then Lego if I didn't kind of pull out detail as necessary add detail where they want it the, the same kind of idea exactly but more manufacturing you exactly assume. So this uh, this is this is easily this is eighty hours of work. It's two week job, and I thought that that sounded like a lot of time, but to do something this exacting with this level of detail, really, really, it looks like hard. way more than two uh, two weeks to me. It's it was exhausting, um, and so there's there's. This front part was actually hand carved out of uh, material we use all the time called Ren Shape, okay. which is a uh, it, it's a basically it's like a modeling plastic that you can work it like wood. You can saw it. You can drill it, you can file it, you can sand it, um, but it's very lightweight and it paints really well. And it's a, it's a, a real staple in model making uh, and prototyping. Okay. Uh, I, I love this model. The y wing It's gorgeous. One of the bastard children of the Star Wars ships, and I, I've always thought, had a special place in my heart for it. Well, it's the, it's the already obsolete fighter used by the underdogs. It exactly. doesn't get any shittier than that. No, I know. And when, when you see it in the ragtag fleet, I know I'm mixing my science oh, yeah. fiction genres. Uh, you just know that they're like, oh, those scrappy guys, they, they better win. They put the fat guy in one of those. <laughs> it's not right. Oh, yeah. Poor Porkins. All right. So uh, this is another example. This is uh, this is another prototype, but this was made for episode two. Okay. This looks really familiar from, from, from the original trilogy, too. And this looks familiar for a very good reason. Uh, in episode two, there's a scene that takes place in uh, uh, in the Lars household. Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. Yes. Okay. Uh, where, where, uh, uh, where Luke is, and they wanted to show... In Star Wars, you can see the, the T-11 Skyhopper mm -hmm. in, in that place. So you know, and that's, it's also the ship Luke is playing with. Yeah, it's, he has a little model on a stick and he's practicing swoops and stuff. Right, so for episode two, they wanted to shoot in the same location, but they wanted an earlier version of the T-11 Skyhopper. So okay. I don't know what we would call this, maybe the, the T-8 Skyhopper. Okay. Um, so I basically looked at all the reference I, that we had for that, and I built a, 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 a prototype model for what the earlier version would be. And the main, the, a lot of the structure is quite similar. The end Engines are very different. Uh, that's one of the places where I really changed, and uh, I did a bunch of really fun kit bashing under there. I had a lot of fun with this, and I was super excited because I was an early hire on episode two. There wasn't a lot going on, so you know, my, my supervisor Brian gave this to me, and I was like, "Oh, this is great! If this ends up being in the movie, then I've built this thing that's in the movie." <laughs> 
apparently, the, the, so this went to a meeting, and George looked at it and was like, oh, it looks like a T-11 T Skyhopper. And uh, they like, well, yeah, because it's a precursor. And he's like, oh, the only reason we built it like this is because we only had a lot of plywood. We did a lot of money. <laughs> oh, so they threw no. this out, and they built it out of CG. Oh. Uh, never got used in anything in the film. Uh, I meant it was given to me at the end of the production. Um, oh. It's one of my favorite possessions because uh, you know I, I didn't keep very much of, of what I did back in those days it's all on its own it's it, but it, you know it does immediately evoke that and you kind of look at anything oh, is it a shuttle is it a, is it the, the swoop what what could it possibly be that's that's really awesome um, and also I will say that um, this has almost no laser cutting in this again I was the laser guy at okay. ILM and I loved using the laser cutter but this is almost entirely scratch built out of styrene and this is I believe a not much more than a two or three day project at the most. Okay, so this was this was literally you came into work, worked for eight or nine hours a day, walk away, yeah. and three days later this is done. That's fantastic. And we're done, yeah. Um, I, I always love that. And we're gonna talk about kit bashing later, but just in case people don't know, this is yes. something kind of neat. The idea behind kit bashing is, the idea behind kit bashing, and it's it's been a staple of the special effects universe since the first important uh, films, uh, how do I say this? Where things felt real, and I would I would include in that uh, 2001 okay. Silent Running. Uh, those those films use ships, and they're precursors to Star Wars. Yeah, Star Wars is the pinnacle of that at that early stage. But you'd you'd create a main body of a ship, and then you'd want to add details to it that felt real and industrial. You would go take other model kits of things like. Uh, German uh, guns or motorcycles, uh, American tanks. You'd take all these models and you would pull little parts off of them and you'd glue them to your model. Hold on, so so you'd just go to the hardware store and clean out the the muscle car section or the battleship right. section. So if you, if I pull this off its post and you look under here and you can see a lot of there's a lot of detail in here. Well, all this detail, wow. these are from model kits, car kits, pieces of of, of of other Star Wars kits even. So when you were at ILM, was there just a giant wall of this stuff or did you guys take the company card down to the hardware no, store no, no, and clean no, no. it out? It was a huge loft. And in fact, there's in the end, there's there's about, I mean, there was hundreds of kits in this loft, um, but there were some to which you, I'm not sure I'm gonna get that right on this one, to, but there were some oh, that God. you were turned to repeatedly. There's like this German Flakwürling, which has all of these unbelievable little beautiful parts that just went into almost every spaceship ever. There's one, which is this little dome with four pips that we called the Universal Greebly. Greebly okay. is what we call those details. Okay. The Universal Greebly, the UG, uh -huh. um, was on, I think, nearly every single Industrial Light <laughs> Magic model almost ever. <laughs> In fact, we used it on every model that came out of that shop. Uh, and we used it in Space Cowboys on some part that later on they built a full-size set off of our model and we could see in their full-size set they've got the Universal <laughs> Greeblies this big. We're like, yes, it's there. Um, so this is the Wilhelm scream exactly. of, the, of the model making world. Exactly, Universal Greeblies, Wilhelm scream. Um, so that's kit bashing, is using other model kits to add detail to your model kit. You can do it in two, you can add detail in two ways. You could scratch build everything mm -hmm. or you can get a lot of mileage out of using other model kits. Fantastic. Okay, so what's number three over here? This I'm gonna scooch, is, scoot the uh, skyhopper out of the way. This is uh, towards the towards the end of my tenure as a as a model maker for hire. Um, this is one of the front two guns on one of the ships from the Matrix trilogies. Okay, trilogies is the because in the Trilogy. first movie there's basically one ship. Right, in the first there's the Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, uh, in the second there's a few ships. Uh, this one we called it all the way through the shooting the Mjolnir which is Thor's hammer. Yeah, um, everybody I, knows that now. Everyone knows that Why now. Why would you no not know that? that then. Nobody oh. knew that then. Oh, and we all thought that was really cool, all oh, the Mjolnir. And we come, yeah. of course we didn't know, we were calling it the Mjolnir. Well, I mean, it's the silent M at the <laughs> beginning is a little tricky. <laughs> um, but uh, it, when the movie came out, they just called that ship the hammer. They, they Perfect, makes perfect sense. Chickened out. Well, I mean, if that was the worst mistake they made in those movies, then we wouldn't be talking about it right now. It's totally true. Anyway, so uh, I, I, but I thought those ships were all CG. They were. Okay. However, for uh, for a movie like the, for movies still, when you want when you want to do uh, uh, when you want something to blow up, when you want it to be damaged, 
the physics of the damage are still really hard to get right. It's not something where you just put it into a physics engine and hope that it works. You really gotta have an animator animate each thing so it really feels right. And those can be devilishly difficult. You look up the, you read the sin effects about the mechanics of uh, the Hulk smashing around Loki in the yeah. Avengers, and they that was really hard for them to get right, to where it felt like he was flipping around a real thing that still moved like a doll, but within the real but has the skeleton. The world. And right. I mean, they did a horrible job with that floppy body's physics for three, four years early on. Yeah. If you look at like the Lord of the Rings movies and even the early Harry Potter movies, there's rag yeah. dolls flapping like they have no skeletons. Exactly. It looks terrible. So, so they build real props. So, so you build real props. So we build real props and then we're, they're specifically for blowing up and destroying. I can't, I don't want to alarm you, Adam. That doesn't look like it's been blown up. No, well, so, so in the end of the Matrix trilogy, uh, the hammer, crashes through the doors, the closing doors of the dock, the okay. central battleground of the third movie. Uh, and our team uh, actually built, these guys spent months on this, a, I think like 25 foot long fiberglass hammer ship with a, like 16 foot high doors that actually operated. Wow. Um, I, I did all the laser cutting on the gearing that opened the doors. Oh, the, the, that, there's a plot point there. Yeah, the doors were actually, um, the doors were actually hand soldered out of lead sheet. So that, so that, and all of this was, oh. and then the ship was actually mounted to this massive gear ratio, uh, 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 gear advantage that would allow them to accelerate it over I think 75 feet, or no, maybe like 100 feet, on this track to like 40 miles an hour. So that <laughs> ship crashing through the doors was covered by a bazillion cameras, many cranked at a very high rate of speed. Oh yeah. And so it's a real ship crashing into real doors so that everything looks real with explosions and everything. Wow, so, so that is literally a, you got one shot they got to get one that one right. They actually, uh, yeah, they got one shot to get it right. They did actually build two sets of doors and two ships because you can't, <laughs> you can't put all your eggs in that basket. Um, but oh, that's fantastic. Uh, the Matrix model team spent months and months and months on that one shot because it is the pinnacle of the movie. Yeah. You, you put all your eggs in that basket. Uh, and I, so in order to build this, again, like you said, the ship was CG. I got a CG model. I can't remember what program it was in, Maya or something like that. Mm -hmm. I took that the guns out of that model, converted them to Rhino, which I knew. And then in Rhino, I separated out their parts and pieces, made blueprints, wow. and I hand built this. Uh, over about, I think this is about a one week job. So then did, did this become the casting that all the other guns on the ship came off of? Or yeah, but it? there's only two. I mean, okay. the, guns only, the, the ships only had two of these main gun pods on their Oh, and front the rest of them were like little turrets that are exactly. all around. Exactly. Okay. So uh, I sent this to our mold making department. Uh, the mold making department made castings and, um, you know, because I could, I asked them to make me one extra set of castings so I could have an Why artifact not? for myself at the end yeah. of the Matrix film. That's fantastic. that's the best thing I've seen that came out of the Matrix film. You're, you're, now you're not supposed to do that as a model maker. Oh, uh, well, not to, so okay. Uh, to the producers of the Matrix, I'm sorry. I, I don't feel like you guys are going to come after me, which is why I'm talking about it publicly. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, this is this is a great example of the real workaday for hire kind of stuff you've got to do. It seems like there are a lot of kind of unspoken rules of the model making. Uh, there are. We, we talked about uh, uh, recasting. recasting on a, maybe an already aired or upcoming episode of Still Untitled. Yes. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's a lot going on here. Uh, th this is actually, I will tell you that between these three. Um, the Y-Wing and this are more difficult because I'm following existing reference. I have to build to the exact extents of the reference that I've got. But this is something we've talked about, a lot. you know, when you talk about the Blade Runner pistol and the, when they made the initial design for that, I mean, they went into a gun shop and said, oh, I like this and I like that. Right. And, and then the gunsmith put they together kind of something in make like it up. two weeks, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Whereas when you wanted to recreate that, it took hundreds and hundreds of hours. Right. It's the same thing for this and, and that, but not necessarily this, right? Yeah, it's much more difficult to do the archival stuff where you've got to follow existing reference material precisely, as opposed to, on Star, you know, we were working on Star Wars, a lot of the time the art director, in my case it was Doug Chang, who's just amazing, Doug would come over with a drawing and be like, I want you to build this, and 
you know, your supervisor would go, it's got to be about this tall. And everything else is kind of up to you. As long as you're getting the details right, they don't mess with you. you and know? this is when you were building new ships for yeah, Star Wars or whatever. building Newton Rune's shuttle for, for episode one or Padme's, well, Padme's apartment had to be pretty exact because they had an interior that we had to match to an exterior. Oh, right. Um, but yeah, a lot of times you're doing set extensions where you're just, you're able to kind of free flow and that gets really, really fun. Um, museum quality work, like this toy prototyping, it's, when they first told me how much they had to spend per model, I thought it sounded like a lot of money. And in the end, I barely made money on this job. I built four separate models for Galoob Toys oh, back wow. then. Yeah. Wow. It was, it was my shop. A lot of micro machines. Production. Oh, and, and then I had to make molds of these because they wanted three of each. Why did they want three of each? Uh, you know? They send one to China. They keep one. Ah. It's, 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 they're paying me so that they end up with three prototypes that are master prototypes. And of course, I, you know, I made one extra for well, myself. Well, why not? Yeah. Yes. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Adam. This has been uh, very informative, I hope. And uh, we'll be back with more from the cave soon. I'm Will. See you guys later. I'm Adam. Good night.